preaching from the auditorium of the Bean Blossom Baptist Church where I'm a member. Of course, most of you know me. I'm Preacher McBride, and we've been there with you in the church before. And in the circumstances that we're in, we're all sort of doing what we can. And one of the things we can do is have services online. <clears throat> so we're recording this at the, at the Bean Blossom Baptist Church. We're going to send it over, hopefully be a blessing and encouragement to you during this time. We appreciate the goodness of the Lord. Appreciate our friends at Putnamville Baptist Church. I want to read just a verse of scripture and then we're going to look at several passages in the Bible this morning or, or today. And I want you to notice just this one verse to begin with in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Paul says this, the Apostle Paul, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, I want you to notice this little phrase. Paul said, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. I notice that also over in the book of Philemon, 
Paul mentioned this. He'll mention it other places too. But in the book of Philemon, this little book, Paul will talk about in verse 23, he'll say there, salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. And also a little earlier in the book of uh, Philippians, Paul, or excuse me, Philemon, Paul will talk about this. He'll say, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, Paul is our hero. He is a hero of the faith. We love to read about him. We, we get a little overwhelmed sometimes when we think about the kind of Christian that Paul was. We'd like to be that kind of Christian. But I think about some of the things that he said about his Christian life. I thought about this. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ which liveth in me in the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. And I don't know about you, but I... I, I have difficulty with that. I want to I wanna reckon myself to be dead under sin. I want to live up to that statement that Paul made. I think about this statement Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Now you think about that statement. Paul said, I'm willing to be spent for you. I tell you, that, that is a Christian statement if ever has one been uttered in the Word of God. And then he <clears throat> added on top of that, he said, I love you more, even though when I love you more, you love me less. And you know, that's something to aspire to in the Christian life, uh, to be willing to be spent for the good of someone else, and then also to love folks more, even if they love you less. We're talking about real Christianity here. And then Paul made this statement in the book of Acts, chapter 20. Verse 26 and 27, he said, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. He said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I wonder how many of us could say that we are pure from the blood of all men. I wonder how many of us could say that we've never, we have never shunned to declare the whole counsel of God before people. I, I, I'm ashamed to say there have been some times I've been a little closed mouth about the gospel, maybe because of the situation that I was in. But I'm thinking about Paul. I would like to be a Christian like Paul. I'm thinking about what he was known for. And I, I thought about this a little bit today. Paul was known for his courage. He never did seem to back up in the face of whatever odds there were. Paul did what he was supposed to do. I think about him on Mars Hill in the company of all of those unbelievers and all of those uh, worshipers of false gods. And what did Paul do? He got up and preached the gospel to them. And uh, I think about when the Jews were angry and they were angry at Paul. What did he do? He preached the gospel to them. He is a man of great courage. I, I'd like to be a man of great courage, a Christian of great courage. And then he was a man of great candor. He just said what needed to be said at the time that it needed to be said. I thought about when he talked about uh, how he had withstood Peter to his face. Peter, another man of God, but Peter was doing wrong. And, uh, and so Paul said, when I saw it, he said, I withstood him to his face. He was a man who said what needed to be said at the time when it needed to be said. And then I think we admire Paul for his compassion. He was a man who loved people, wanted to see people help, wanted to see the gospel preached and lives being changed. We see that, I think, when he talked to Philemon, saying that letter about Onesimus. And uh, he, he was concerned about the welfare of others. And then he's a man of great commitment. He was committed to Christ and he was committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's a great apostle and a great missionary. And I, I'm thankful for the apostle Paul. And all of these things are true of him and, and we aspire to those things. But I want us to learn something else from the life of the apostle Paul and something I think that would be very fitting to the circumstance that we're in right now in America and in our churches. And that is another thing that Paul is known for, something that uh, we think about when we think of Paul, not only his courage and his candor and his compassion and his commitment, but his confinement. Now, I just read you three passages of Scripture where Paul talked about being a prisoner, about being in bonds, about being a fellow prisoner. Now, if you think about that, Paul is at a, you might call it a disadvantage, or at least we would look at it in the natural realm and say Paul is at a disadvantage. He is confined. Paul spent a good part of his ministry in a prison, different kinds of prisons at different times. 
but he spent a good part of his ministry confined. In other words, limited in what he was able to do. I know he would have wanted to go to preach to every in every place possible, but there was sometimes he could not do that. He was confined in a jail cell or in a prison. Do you know where we find ourselves today? We find ourselves somewhat confined. Now, it's not like Paul in that we're in a prison. I'm staying at my own house. I don't very often get to do that. In fact, when this, if things go the way they're saying about this a coronavirus deal, I will have spent more time at home this year than I probably spent all put together the last three years. If I spend three months at the house, like it looks like I'm going to, that's longer than I've spent at the house at one time in quite a long time. I think last year I might have spent, if you put them all together, I might have spent 30 days at the house. So I'm at my old house. I'm not confined in a jail. I'm not in a prison cell. Uh, I'm not eating prison food this morning. We had farm fresh eggs that I got from a pastor and we had uh, sausage and we had uh, homemade biscuits with homemade uh, strawberry freezer jam. Now that was a pretty good meal. We've been eating pretty good. As a matter of fact, I'm a little concerned that if I spend enough time in confinement at the house, I may end up weighing 300 pounds by the time I get out of here. But I'm not confined in a prison, nor are you. But we are somewhat confined at home, and we are somewhat limited. We can't get together like we usually do, and I miss these services. I miss getting to see the folks and talk with them and fellowship a large part of coming to the house of God. It's not just worship, though that is important. It's not just the preaching of the word of God, though that is important. It's not just the singing of the songs of Zion, though that is important. It's the fellowship of believers. And, and Paul knew that. I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. You may not agree with that. That's okay. You'll find out I'm right when you get to heaven. But uh, uh, Paul said this in the book of Hebrews. He said, uh, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So he knew the importance of fellowship. And I miss that fellowship, but we're doing what we can. So we are confined, and we might put it this way. We are somewhat limited in what we can do. So you say, preacher, well, what are we going to do? Well, let's learn a lesson from the Apostle Paul. What are we going to do in this time when we are confined? Some of us can't go to work. Uh, if, you're, if you work in a place that is not considered essential, uh, you may not be allowed to go to work. Some are ill and cannot go to work. And some, in some places they are. There are stay-at-home orders where you're not to leave, except maybe to go to the doctor, maybe to buy groceries. So what are we going to do during this time? We're limited like Paul was limited. What are we going to do? Well, let's look at our hero, the Apostle Paul, and let's find out what he did in the time that he was limited. And maybe we can take this time where it looks like we're limited and turn it around and do great things for God. That's what I'd like to do. Isn't that what you'd like to do? I want us to think about, and I have seven things that I find that that Paul did while he was in confinement and we'll look at them a little bit in the scripture. I want you to notice first of all, I'm going to put it this way. I alliterated these all with the letter P that'd be easy to understand. And the first thing I want you to notice is that when Paul was confined, he spent some time pondering. He pondered, he thought. You said, preacher, what did he ponder about? What did he what did he think about? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, I want you to notice what Paul says as he writes to Timothy. In the latter part of this passage, Paul said this, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. He said, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, now listen to this, but especially the parchments. Now what is Paul talking about when he talks about the parchments? He's talking about the word of God. And so Paul says to Timothy, while I'm in prison here, while I'm limited in what I can do, while I'm confined in what I can do, I want you to bring me the Bible. I want you to make sure I have copies of the word of God, the parchments, the Old Testament. Paul was interested in it. I get the idea that in this time when Paul is confined, here's what he's going to do. He's going to get in the word of God. He's going to learn all he can about the Bible. I'll tell you what we can do in this time. We spend some time in the Bible. A lot of times people say, well, preacher, I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to read verses and chapters in the Bible. I don't have time for that. Well, you've got time now, haven't you? I, I was reading today. I got an email 
for Brother uh, Jim Fallour down in uh, Milton, Florida. And he sends me an email every now and again because of the printing ministry there. and tells me about meetings going on. And he made this statement in that email. He said that the average adult person, uh, average now, can read 300 words per minute. And this is what Brother Fuller said, and I haven't calculated this all out, just telling you what he told me in his email. He said if the average adult person can read 300 words in a minute, then if you put that together, if you'll take his Bible and read three hours per day, three hours a day in a month, he could have his Bible read through. Now that'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? Read your whole Bible through in a month. The Bible said, uh, by word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Young men, the Bible said, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Old Testament prophet said, thy words were found and I did eat them. And he said they were sweet. He talked about them. So I'm, I'm thinking about uh, what we ought to be doing in this time is pondering in the word of God. We ought to be reading it, committing it to memory. We could spend some time. I hope you do this already. I hope you've already been memorizing, but what an opportunity we have while we're at the house, while we have time that we don't usually have to study and read the Word of God. I remember hearing about uh, Dr. Gibbs uh, was in a, in a trial and he was trying to defend a Christian man who uh, had been arrested because he was practicing Christianity. And the prosecutor had that man on the stand and he said to that man something like this. He said, now, sir, you say you are a Bible believer and you're telling us that the things you were doing, you were doing because the Bible teaches them and that God would have you to do them. And the man said, yes, sir. So he said, you are a Bible believer. He said, yes, sir. Then he said, I want to ask you this question, sir. Since you're telling us you are a Bible believer, have you ever read your Bible through from cover to cover? And the man had not done that and he had to hang his head in shame there in that courtroom. I don't want to have that kind of testimony. I've read my Bible through. I hope you're reading yours through. But here's an opportunity to read it through in, in a month in this time that we have. So during this confinement, let's spend time pondering in the Word of God. I'm going to tell you, there's treasure in there, friend. You'll find some things in there that'll help you. You say, oh, preacher, I'm concerned. I'm worried. I have anxiety. Well, get in the Bible and read where uh, we're told to be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and something occasion with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds by Christ Jesus you say well I'm a little bit frightened and get in your Bible and read where the psalmist said what time I'm afraid I will trust in thee you say well preacher I'm thinking about all the things that will uh, that may go on may happen tomorrow then read in your Bible in Matthew 6 where it says, uh, take no thought for tomorrow, for uh, tomorrow shall take thought for itself. Uh, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If you get in your Bible, there's treasure in there that will help you get through this time. I, I was reading where somebody said there's there's going to be a lot of anxiety at home and people at home and there may be suicides. I'm certainly not making light of that. Our president said there'll be drug addiction and things like that. And there'll be there's been an uptick and an uprise in domestic violence already during these quarantines. But I'm going to tell you, friend, if we spend time in our Bible, it'll soothe our souls. We'll spend time in our Bible hearing from God. I hope you'll read your Bible during this time. Let's look at our hero, Paul, and let's do what he did. Let's ponder in the Word of God. Then I want you to look at another passage of Scripture in the book of Acts and the 16th chapter. And I want you to see another thing that Paul did while he's in the prison. Here he's in the prison for preaching the Word of God. And uh, they've been beaten, he and Silas, and they've been charged not to preach in the name of the Lord. And they take them in verse number 24 of Acts 16. Well, let's read verse 23. And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So here's Paul in prison. Reckon what he'll be doing. What will our hero be doing in the prison? Well, look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. You see that? At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. What were they doing when they were confined in the jail cell? They, they were not only Paul, would not only spend time pondering in the word of God so that he might hear from the Lord. He had some things to say to the Lord. I'm glad the Lord is listening to us. 
I'm glad we can pray. I'm glad you say, well, preacher, I can't get a hold of this one and I can't get a hold of that one. Let me tell you, you can get a hold of, you can get a hold of the Lord. David said, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. He said he inclined his ear unto me. In the 130th Psalm, uh, David talked about, out of the depths will I cry unto the Lord. And I'm glad God is a tender God and he's a compassionate God. And he'll hear us when we cry. He'll hear us when we pray. You say, well, preacher, I have no one to talk to. You can talk to Jesus, friend. You say, well, preacher, I have no one to tell my, uh, my heartaches to. You can tell your heartaches to Jesus. You can pray and be a man of prayer like Paul is a man of prayer. Well, you say, preacher, I don't know what to pray for. Well, let me help you. You can pray for me. I need your prayers. Pray for Brother McBride. Pray that Brother McBride will be true to the Word of God and true to the things of God during this time. Pray for our family. I remember some years ago we were in a meeting out in Delaware and we were sitting around the table. There were several preachers, pastors, and some missionaries, evangelists. There's a young Christian, just a new Christian there sitting at the table. We was talking about praying. And one preacher talked about the time that he'd spent in prayer that day. And that young that young Christian uh, kind of, he sort of, uh, interrupted. He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, I, I hear you talking about how much time you spend in prayer. He said, what, how do you know? How can you spend that much time in prayer? He said, I pray for a few minutes and I run out of things to pray for. And well, we all looked at one another. And one of us, I don't remember which one of us said, but one of us said to him, do you have a prayer list? He said, a what? He said, a prayer list. He said, what's a prayer list? He said, a prayer list where you write down things and people that you need to pray for. I'll tell you, friend, you and I, as many folks as we know that have needs, we'll have a long prayer list. And we should, be, we should be praying that prayer list. We should be like Samuel in the Old Testament when he said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you all. Somebody will say, well, preacher, I haven't had time to pray. Well, we have some time now. Let's bombard the throne of grace. And there's a lot of things to pray for. A lot of people to pray for. Here in America, I know we're facing difficulty, but we're not facing it like they are in other countries. I, I know that I know missionaries. I heard from a missionary uh, this week, Brother Robert Murray. You could pray for the Murray family that's in Bolivia. And Miss Eden that's in Bolivia. You could pray for the McLeans who have just gone to Bolivia. And Brother Murray uh, texted me and said they're only allowed to go out one time a week to get groceries and they're not allowed to drive. They have to walk. And he said, you have to have ID. And if you're caught without ID, then you put in jail. And he said, the McLeans have just come over and they don't have any ID yet. So they're not allowed to get out of the house. So he said, we're grocery shopping for them too. He said, what can I pray for? Pray for the Murrays. Pray for Miss Eden, who's over there. Young single lady over there working in a school and teaching. You can pray for Miss, uh, Miss Eden Johnson. You can pray for the McLeans that God will meet their needs. There are a lot of folks to pray for. You can pray for your pastor. You pray for those in authority. Pray for our president. He needs help. And uh, he needs the wisdom of God. And those that are in charge. And there are those who would like to destroy him. Even in the midst of this difficulty and what we're facing, there are those who still are involved in politics and want to bring him down. Not worrying about the problem that we're in. You say, preacher, get political. No, I, I want, it's spiritual. The Bible said we're to pray for those that are in authority over us. And so there are many enemies. So I think we're going to pray for the for uh, the, the uh, president and pray for the cabinet and pray for our governors and our mayors and, and just pray. Pray for these doctors and nurses that are on the front line in this thing and hazarding their lives. Pray for them. Pray for the man of God. Pray for your preacher. He needs wisdom during this time. Pray that the, uh, that the needs of the church will be met. There's a lot of things to pray for. And Paul was a man of prayer. He said, praying always. He said, another place, he said, finally, brethren, pray for us. When he talked with Philemon, he said, I thank God making mention of the always in my prayers. I want to make sure that we're praying. I hope you're praying during this time. Uh, well, what else did Paul do? Well, he pondered and he prayed, but there's more in this verse, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. Now watch this, and sang praises unto God. Here's what else Paul did in confinement. He praised God. He lifted up the name of the Lord. He, he praised the Lord. That's what we ought to be doing in this time. 
A lot of folk want to mope and they want to grumble. That doesn't do anybody any good. They want to say, well, how hard it is. I wish I could do that. I wish I could do this, do something else. I'll tell you what you ought to do. You and I ought to get up out of bed in the morning and say, hallelujah. Uh, praise the Lord. I was able to get up out of bed. Praise the Lord. I can take a breath and get air in my lungs. Praise the Lord for my family. Praise the Lord for the food that's on the table. Praise God for what he's done for us. Man, we ought, we ought to always be praising the Lord. You say, well, preacher, we're going through hard times. Job went through a hard time, didn't he? Much harder time than you and I were going through. Job had lost everything he had. Job had lost his, his children. And what does the Bible say that Job did? Here's what it said, Job 121. And it said, Job said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What was he doing? He was worshiping his praise in the Lord. I'll tell you, there's a lot of things to praise him about. A lot of things to praise him about. You know, I, I sometimes preach about the internet, and I have a message I preached about uh, close the gate, shut the gate, about keeping bad influences out of your life. And certainly there are bad influences on the internet, but I, I would say right now, praise God for the internet. I've been uploading sermons on the, on the, on different channels on the, uh, on the internet and folks have been listening to me preach down in Mississippi and in Georgia and uh, they've been listening in uh, where else they've been listening they've been li listening in Indiana and they've been listening uh, in different places around the country Arkansas they're listening and uh, and and here this morning I'm over here in Bean Blossom or today I'm over in Bean Blossom and uh, you're over there uh, wherever you are Putnamville uh, over there and 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 uh, near Greencastle I guess and and you're hearing me preach over here that's the internet so here's what I can say I say praise God for the internet praise God that we have the opportunity to do things like this man think of the mess we'd be in if we didn't have a way to get these messages out nobody to preach to and uh, nobody to be able to find comfort through the preaching of the word of God so I'm thankful I'm thankful for what God has done and what he is doing. So we just need to praise him. I, I'll tell you what, if you think about it, you can find something to praise God for. I remember when I used to pastor and I would counsel with people. One of the things I would do, it was mandatory. If you wanted to counsel with Preacher McBride, first thing you had to do was every morning when you got up out of bed, you had to write down five things that you could thank God for and praise him for. And then they would bring those to me and, and it was just mandatory. They had to bring it to the office when they'd come. we sit down in the council session. I'd say, do you have your praise list? And they'd have one for every day, the things they were thankful for. And you say, well, preacher, do you think they really praised God about it? Well, I don't know whether they did or whether they, whether they didn't, but I know one thing, they had to think about it when they got up in the morning. And so I hope they praised him, but you and I ought to be praising him. He is worthy of our praise. He's been good to you and he's been good to me and he's blessed us and he's helped us. And we ought to just thank him and praise him. And Paul did that. Paul was in a bad place here, but he's singing praises unto God. And you notice the people that were with him, the prisoners, the latter part of that verse said the prisoners heard them as they praised him. And that's important. And then in verse 26, apparently God heard him. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken immediately. All the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. I'm trying to praise the Lord. You know, I'm with my family, my wife and my daughter there at the house. But I've got a neighbor very close and, and he's, a, he's a fine man. He's been very kind to us, and we've been trying to be kind to him. In fact, he told me today, he said, Preacher, I got a freezer full of meat, got hams in there, all kind of meat. He said, if you need something, you go over there and get it. And I thanked him. But as far as I know now, and from his own admission, uh, he's not living for the Lord. And I'm, I've talked to him here and there, and, and uh, whether he's saved or not, that's for him to decide. That's for him to say, but but he would uh, he would tell you, and he's told me plainly. He said, "I'm not doing all I should be, but I, but I'm trying to I'm trying to praise the Lord for His sake. I want Him to hear when I say how good the Lord's been to me, and I try often when I'm talked to just to interject and say, "Boy, the Lord's been good." And of course, we don't we don't spend a lot of time fellowshipping because of the six foot rule. Amen. We're practicing social distancing, but we can talk to one another across the driveway. We've done that a couple of times here lately. I. I've tried to check on him and he checks on us. And I'm, I'm trying to praise the Lord in front of him, trying to be a testimony. And you could be a testimony to those that are around you. 
praising the Lord, instead of talking about how hard it is, talk about how good God's been to you in the midst of this pestilence. So we find Paul pondering, and we find Paul praying, and we find Paul praising. What else did Paul do? Well, let's go over to Philemon, back to this little book of Philemon, if you want to turn there, only one chapter. And I want you to notice what else Paul did. If we start reading in verse 8, Philemon chapter 1 and verse 8, here's what the Bible said. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. You know what I think Paul did? He preached. He preached to Onesimus. Apparently, now I think Onesimus was the servant of Philemon, and apparently he ran off and sconded with some property that belonged to Philemon. I don't know what exactly that property was, but, but Paul uh, ended, was in the prison and somehow Onesimus ended up in the same prison. And so Paul preached to him and Onesimus got right with God. He got saved. And so when he got saved, Paul said, now I'm going to get out. I'm going to write you a letter. And I want you to take it back to Philemon. And I want you to get your I want to get your heart right with the Lord. Now get your heart with right with Philemon. Make it right. That'd be good for all of us to do. The things we can make right when we get saved, we ought to make them right. Some things you have to leave alone. You, you can't do anything about them. Just go on. But other things you could make right. You could pay old debts and such like that. And so Onesimus went back. But but how did what did Paul mean? I have begotten in my bonds. Well, the other thing is he led him to Christ. He got saved. He got born again. Paul preached to him. So I think Paul did some preaching in his confinement. I also read, and I won't make you turn there, but I read in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 22, Paul said this, all the saints salute you chiefly they that are Caesar's household. Now let me ask you this. How did, how did there come to be saints in Caesar's household? Well, I would surmise, and I think you would too, that probably Paul preached to them. They tell me, some writers tell me, that during some parts of his confinement and imprisonment, Paul would have been chained to a Roman soldier uh, 24 hours a day. It wouldn't be the same soldier. They'd come in shifts, and Paul would be chained to them. I don't know about that. I'm just telling you what. Uh, fellows are a lot smarter than I am about history and the Bible. That's what they say. Now, could you imagine being chained to the Apostle Paul? Could you imagine being a Roman soldier and the Apostle Paul chained to you and him, him over there praying and then saying how good God's been to him and praising and worshiping God? You say, would Paul do that in the prison? Well, sure he did. We just read about it over there in the book of Philippians. At midnight, they prayed and sang praises unto the Lord. And so Paul preached and probably some of those folks got saved, maybe some of them soldiers. The gospel, you know, has power. So here we are, we're confined. What can we do? Well, we can preach. We can preach. Maybe you can preach to your neighbors a little bit. Maybe you can preach to your family a little bit. Maybe you can do this. There's so much social media today, and I, I'm not on social media. I'm not on Facebook, unless what I'm preaching here, somebody puts it on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook account, and I, I don't have a Twitter account. I'm not getting after you if you do. I, I just don't do it. But I'm thinking about this. You know, if you're going to read your Bible, and I'm going to read my Bible, surely God's going to speak to us about something in the Bible. Sure that you say, well, preacher, I'm not a preacher. I, I can't preach. Well, here's what you can do. You can testify. You can testify. You find something in the Bible that really helped you that day. You could put it on your Facebook account instead of putting on there what you made for breakfast and, and uh, what time you went to bed and all that other stuff people put on there and the junk people put on there. You could put the Bible on there. You could put on there something God really dealt with your heart about from the Word of God. You could do a little preaching. You could send out a tweet with a little preaching in it. I don't know how all that stuff works, but surely you could put some Bible in there. You could be a blessing to somebody uh, by preaching the gospel. And I don't mean you have to have a sermon. I don't mean you have to have an outline. I don't mean you have to be ordained. I don't mean you have to be licensed. I just mean you have to have heard from God. Have you heard from God lately? I tell you, if you get in your Bible and you pray, I believe you'll hear from God. God will speak to your heart. Maybe it'll be so personal and you can't share it, but sometimes he'll do some things that'll just get alive in you. You can talk to somebody about you and say, boy, let me tell you what the Lord told me today while I was in while I was in my devotions. I was talking to my good friend Robert Jones the other day, and he was telling me about, he said, preacher, he said, God's changing my ministry around during all of this 
COVID-19 stuff. And I said, what do you mean? He said, God dealt with me in my devotions the other morning and just laid some things on my heart. And he started telling me, he didn't tell me a lot, but a little bit. And what was he doing? He just testified. He's preaching. He's testifying to the goodness of God. You and I could do that during this time. And so we find Paul, he's pondering, he's praying, he's praising, he's preaching. And then there's something else that Paul did. He penned some things down. Paul writes, you know, these New Testament epistles that we're reading, uh, we call them, not all the New Testament, but some of these epistles, we call them the prison epistles. You know why we call them that? Because he wrote them while he's in the prison. That's what John Bunyan did. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress while he's in the prison. And you say, well, preacher, I'm confined. What can I do? Won't you write some letters? Maybe you're not, you're not on social media. Uh, maybe you don't, you don't Facebook and maybe you don't tweet on Twitter or whatever it is you do on Twitter. But here's what you could do. You could write some letters. Paul did that from the prison. He didn't have social media, but apparently he had access to write some things. I, I read over in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, and verse 11. He said, yea, or he said, ye see how large a letter I've written unto you in mine own hand. Now, some Bible students believe that Paul, his problem with his eyes, his, his thorn in the flesh, they believe was his eye problem. I don't know if that's true, but some believe that. That's what they teach. And so when he, they say when he made mention of, you see how large a letter I've written in my own hand, they're saying it's because he had difficulty seeing. And a lot of time, uh, Paul would have someone write for him, someone that was in the prison with him. He would dictate, they would write. But here, when he was confined, he would do that. But here, apparently, in Galatians, he had no one to do that. And he had to write himself. But the fact is, and the important thing is, he wrote. He wrote letters. And I know this is the Bible, and I know it's inspired of God. And we're not claiming any inspiration when we write, but we can write about what the Bible said. I'll tell you about a lady. I was preaching down in one of the suburbs of Knoxville. And the preacher's mother said to me one day, she said, Brother McBride, can I tell you a story about my mama? And I said, well, sure you can. And she said, my mama was bedridden most of her adult life. She had a sickness and she, she couldn't get out of the bed. She was there most of her adult life. And she said, my mama would write letters. She'd get addresses anywhere she, from anywhere she could find. She'd get an address and she would write letters. She said she'd write letters here and there to this one and that, and she'd tell them about Jesus, tell them how good the Lord was and witness to them and testify to them in those letters. She put a track in there. And he said, she said to me, she said, when my mama died, people that had heard, read those letters that had been saved, they came from everywhere to her funeral when they heard she died. And this was a little suburb of Knoxville, and there were so many cars that came to the funeral that it clogged up the roads around the church. The chief of police called the preacher and said, why didn't you tell us somebody important died? We could have sent some police out, some officers out and helped with this traffic jam. And he said to the pastor, he said, who died? Was it a congressman? Was it a senator? Who was it? No, it wasn't a congressman. It wasn't a senator. It's just a little lady who was confined, but she penned some things down. She had a burden for a lost world. You could write some letters during this time. You could write to some folks that need to hear from you. And uh, you say, well, preacher, I, I, don't have, I don't have a smartphone. I, okay, well then, you have a pencil and you have paper and you get your stamp and an envelope and you can send a letter to somebody to be a great encouragement to them. I'm gonna send a letter here uh, probably tomorrow to a young man that's in prison. And uh, he doesn't have any social media. He doesn't have access to any of that. But I can write him a letter and I, I've, I've written him one and sent it and I'm gonna write him another one. You can do that during this time. Uh, so we've got Paul and he's, He's pondering the word. He's praying. He's praising. He's preaching. He's penned some things down. Here's, here's the sixth thing I find that Paul did in the prison. And that is he planned. If we go back to the book of Philemon, Paul will say this in verse 22. But with all, prepare me also a lodging. Notice this. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Paul said, here's what I'm planning. I'm planning on God getting me out of this confinement. And when he gets me out of this confinement, I'm planning that he's going to give me to you. Now, I don't have time to go into the, that word given, but it's the idea of Paul uh, uh, sacrificing his life for them. It's the same word used. And it's the same idea of the word used when, when the Lord gave us his son. And it's Paul saying, I'm willing to sacrifice myself to be given to you as a gift. 
But Paul was planning. He was planning that one day this confinement would be over and he would be able to go in and uh, worship with these folks and help them and be a blessing. Well, I'll be doing some planning. You know, in this particular time, we hear a lot about planning. But you know what we hear about and say, well, you know, I wish I'd have planned better. I wish I'd have had more, most people say, I wish I had more toilet paper. Uh, we were on our way to a meeting and, and uh, we stopped in Withville and called the preacher and, and canceled the meeting because of all this trouble, turned around and came home. And we weren't planning on being home till June. And we didn't have, and we didn't have any food, I don't think, in the house and maybe something in the freezer, but not much food in the house. And I think we had three rolls of toilet paper. And it seems funny to talk about toilet paper in the pulpit. But anyway, that's what people were talking about. They said, well, I wish I had a plan for this. Of course, the Lord taking care of us and provide our needs. We wish I had a plan. And I'm all for that, Lord, plan and plan for the next time in case this happens again. But I tell you what, what's more important than that, that we plan new ways to get the gospel out, that we plan to serve the Lord, that we plan what we're going to do with our life when we get out of this confinement and what we can do for the Lord and uh, get serious about the things of God. This thing is winding up, folks. Uh, we're coming down to the end. And so we all do some planning like Paul was. And then the last thing that I want you to think about in this passage, 2 Timothy chapter number four, here's what Paul said. He said in verse number six, for I'm now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but of all them also that love his appearing. Now, I'd say this, Paul was preparing. He was not only planning for what he could do when he got out of his confinement, but he was preparing to meet the Lord. And you know, he was heeding what the Old Testament prophet had said, prepare to meet thy God. And I'll tell you what we all ought to be doing. We ought to make sure we're prepared. Lord, be sure we're saved. I, I hope you're saved. I hope you've trusted the Lord. I hope you've repented of your sin and believed in the gospel. I hope you've come before him as a sinner, taken your place as a sinner and trusted him as your savior. I hope you've done that. And if you haven't, I wish you'd do it right now. Jesus loves you and he died on the cross for you. And if you receive him as your savior, he'll say, you say, preacher, I'm, I'm afraid about what's going to happen to me. Well, you won't have to have any fear if you've trusted the Lord as your savior. Because Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so you don't have to be afraid if you just trust him. You ought to be prepared in the way of salvation. And then I'm reminded that in one of John's epistles, he said this, he said, uh, he said to prepare uh, to be ready when the Lord comes that we ought to live for him that we would not be ashamed before him now little here's i'm trying to remember the verse and it's coming to me slow but sure now little children abide in him that you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming so i tell you what we ought to be doing this time we ought to be preparing to meet the lord we're going to stand at the judgment seat of christ one day we're going to give an account of our lives the deeds done in the body whether it be good or whether it be evil not just the deeds done when everything was going good, but the deeds right in this time. What did we do with this time? We'll have to answer for it. And so I think we ought to prepare like Paul. He said, he said the time of my departure is at hand. He said, I fought a good fight. I hope we're fighting a good fight. He said, I have finished my course. I hope we're going to finish our course. He said, I've kept the faith. I hope you're going to keep the faith. I want to be like Paul. And I want to live like Paul. I want to remember his example and in the time of our confinement, I want the time to be useful for us, that we might be useful unto God. Let's not waste this time away. Listen to me, dear friend. Let's not spend this time grumbling. Let's not spend this time complaining. Let's not spend this time putting ourselves first. But let's spend this time trying to find something to do for God, for his glory, and for his honor. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for loving us first. We thank you for being so good to us and blessing us and taking care of us. You're a good Lord, a sweet Savior, and a precious God. And Lord, we're thankful. Now I pray you use this sermon this morning to help somebody. The word of God that's been mentioned here, I pray that it'll help somebody that you'll be glorified. And if you are glorified, we'll get help. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.